um, so yeah, let's get let's get started. I actually planned uh, originally two hours for this, but then we had more more speakers, so I'm going to rush this as always. <laughs> or maybe not. If there's any questions along the way, ask me. Um, there's no definite goal. It's just I want to share some fun ideas and um, yeah, hope you enjoy them um, or s have something useful in that, maybe even. Um, so yeah, I want to uh, start kind of simple. I'm going to be using the Tinkerbell core library a bit because it's a, it's a bit of a manifestation of principles I believe in, but it's like the principles transcend that. Feel free to reinvent that because it's much more fun. Um, so yeah, um, where do I start? So this is just a, a Nico uh, project, and I guess everybody um, knows this guy, right? No, what's the name? This one. And then you have a URL, and um, then you, you, I suppose you have an on data something something. So here you handle the data, and so here comes the data, and we're going to do nothing, and we're going to do exactly the same for the error, on error, and then um, we're going to do fun stuff like send the, no, request, yeah, request the request, post, no post. Okay, and I want to use this as a starting point for what's really, really a bad API for a couple of reasons. Um, so this, for example, is, is on Nico, which, uh, which has blocking I.O. So if you do this, then you never get any data. I'm not sure it's specified what happens if you do this. Probably gonna get an error or stuff like that. But you have a lot of, um, a lot of mutations going on in there, like you know, state updates and stuff like that. And um, so let's, let's do something we would do and and let's fix it <laughs> uh, with with uh, Tinkerbell idioms, <coughs> and how that will look like is, for example, I would say so. This is a URL, and maybe then post data is is I don't know is a dynamic of strings, quite possibly. Okay, and. Um, so what we're what we're going to do here, and we're going to do this once. Return. Uh, we're going to create a, a promise of a string. Yeah. Function. Sorry. With a callback. So this is one way of creating futures. It's my my most favorite one. Um, so we have this thing right here. Why is this indenting so weird? Okay. Um, so obviously, when when the data is coming, we're going to call the callback with a with a success. Woo! And otherwise, um, we're going to. I will explain in a moment what's actually happening here. Um, with a new error that will just have this error message, and we probably can use HTTP. Is there a status? Oh no, we have to actually capture that somewhere else. On status. <laughs> um, no, sorry. Where status is, I don't know, let's use 500 because that's just a very generic status code. Um, we have the status here and let's use whatever the server responded as an error message. So this is just a, the error is just a standard error type. There's nothing exciting about it. And then we can, um, if the post data, yeah, no, mm, can't really. If post data is not null, then we can do fun stuff like for f in reflag field, uh, fields of post data. And we can do uh, uh, HTTP set parameter the field, and then we get the the thing back out. I don't really like this so much because it uses reflection, but whatever. Um, okay, and then we're going to request based on whether 
post data is not null, for example. Okay, now what does this uh, give us? Um, there's actually, like if we, if we call this, there's no more ordering issues. Like uh, I suppose we can, we can try example.com. Okay, and then we can handle this. And uh, in here, we actually, so this is an outcome, which I talked about earlier. That's an enum, there's just two parts. It can either be a success or a failure. If you want to get at the data, you have to switch over it. I mean, that's the easiest way. Um, and so, for example, you can say, okay, so blah, 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 data. And then we're going to say loaded the data. And otherwise, um, we can decide to throw an exception here, for example. I mean, it's a silly thing to do. But let's just run this and see what happens. Okay, so apparently I can't resolve example.com. That's really cool. I guess that means I'm offline. Why would that? URL. Sorry? Ha ha ha, very funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it gives me, uh, you know, this, this uh, whatever is on example.com. And uh, so if we, I don't know, I guess there's no hex top level domains now. So this might actually, yeah, okay, so this throws the error. And the thing is, um, the API does not really make a decision about throwing an error or not. Like, uh, you could use this for accessing a file system. You get back a, a promise or just an outcome if it's synchronous. Um, and it's the calling code which, which actually decides. So we could instead here, if we say, all right, we don't really, we're not going to have exceptions. Or if, the, if something goes wrong, we want the whole thing to crash anyway. Uh, so you can call sure on an outcome and it will either generate an exception or it will you know get you the data so if you don't want to write that much so this is yeah relatively helpful and it has roughly the same behavior of course um but the the most important thing that really changed is we don't create mutable objects anymore like and we can't mess up order in any case we can't register a handler too late or do stuff like that um What's also interesting is maybe that uh, we can we can register multiple handlers and stuff like that, uh, which might sometimes be interesting. Like on a on a on an HTTP request, if you have multiple things which register a handler, then you know there's gonna be some rule by which this works or not. And um, another thing that makes this uh, kind of interesting is that, uh, I mean, th there's an alternative approach to, to dealing with many handlers, and that's generic event dispatches, which I guess you've come across in, you know, some call it emitters and stuff like that. But there you kind of lose the, lose the information about how often is an event going to occur or stuff like that. You don't really talk about that, L uh, any of those things. So for example, um, if you take something like URL loader in, in ActionScript, um, it can have, I think, a whole bunch of errors that can come out of it. It uh, can have progress events, all this kind of stuff. And so, um, not going to implement this right now, but let's just imagine um, we, we wanted to have a functionality that's more granular, like kind of what URL loader does. It tells us more. So we're not just going to return a promise, but what we can do is uh, progress, and this is a signal of, um, I don't know, let's say loaded, total int. Okay, let's start <laughs> breaking this up. Um, and uh, the actual data, okay? So, and we're, yeah, for now we're just going to uh, return null to make it compile at all. Um, <coughs> request two. So what does this mean? In, in this case, we're, we're kind of saying, um, okay, so there's going to be a, a progress signal and that is something that, you know, fires multiple times um, with some data that belongs there. 
you can subscribe to it or you can choose not to, it's not really important. And if you want to get at the data, then you have to do it in such a way that all errors pass through your handler again. You know, and this is like a, a I think it's a nicer way to structure code because you can't, you know, forget error handlers and you're gonna have a runtime exception thrown and it destroys your run loop when you <laughs> just wouldn't want it to or, or stuff like that. Um, and it communicates like really clearly wh what is this. I mean, I could tell you, um, I could call this something. Let's call this interface. What is this? I'll, fundamentally, this is maybe a, a download, you know? Um, and I can tell you, all right, uh, let's make these, let's make these read only maybe. Um, so I can tell you, okay, give me a download. And then, you know, y you're gonna know what to, what to implement, whereas you can't uh, really implement a, an event dispatcher of a specific form. That's the two problems that events have. You don't communicate how often something comes and it's also like, it's entirely untyped. So that's, yeah, the, uh, the other part. Um, that can be somehow fixed, but you still lose the, the first information. Okay, and so this, um, I think this kind of stuff matters because once you have these kinds of APIs, you stop being so nervous about, is there maybe an error case that I did not handle? Does this uh, function throw? some stuff that I need to, so you just uh, start uh, having Pokemon try catch all over the place just to be sure and you know you're just going to <laughs> back out of stuff and and actually you might miss an important exception that would tell you something about what's broken you just you know you have no idea um, so yeah this is this is a place where I, where I uh, a direction where I want to nudge this general I don't know uh, Workshop, let's call it that way, um, because I think it's it's quite interesting uh, in Hex that that it's a multi-paradigm language, and um, what it sometimes leads to is that people take it and they want to use one part of it only, like they only want to do object-oriented programming or this. Many people who j only do functional programming and um, and stuff like that, and then they get frustrated because Hex is not the most excellent OOP language, like, you know, we don't have abstract classes and all this. You can't build all of these beautiful hierarchies with 100 layers of stuff. And if they if they are all into functional programming, then, you know, there's no higher kind of types and blah, blah, blah. And doing monads is difficult. Whatever monads are, I haven't figured out. Um, <laughs> anybody can tell me, please do. Uh, okay, but what's, what's actually really quite interesting is that you can, uh, um, that you can combine these two, you can uh, combine the the important ideas of the two. Like what the the code that we have here obviously is not functional. I mean, it's not pure. You know, there's side effects. We're loading stuff, and it's not like we request we make the same request a hundred times. We're gonna get different results, all that kind of stuff. So it's not really functional, but it borrows a couple of ideas, and immutability is one of them. And you can say, okay, so that's purely functional, but ultimately, I don't know a fact. Uh, OOP veteran might say, oh, okay, this is cool. This is actually a factory, you know, which is calling a function and it returns as an object rather than modifying the, the, the same thing in, in place and after having it constructed. So you can do uh, really fun stuff this way. And that's one part. And the, the other part that we can, I think, borrow from, from functional programming is, is um, functional composition in some sense. Like you can really uh, compose functions, I mean, to, to spell this out in, in hex code, um, to compose two functions, you have th three types and you're going to compose F, which goes from F to B, and you take G, with, which goes from B to C, I suppose, and you're gonna get a function f that goes from A to C. Yeah, and I think the compiler is going to tell you something about that. So the input is going to be an A, uh, and what we're going to produce is we're going to apply G to the result of A applied to, okay. So this is a whole lot of nothing and might seem, <laughs> seem confusing at first, but uh, what it's really cool is that if you, if you have these kinds of things, um, you, can, you can chain them 
in, into something linear. And uh, the compiler actually checks that it makes sense. Because if you look at how, how you would often do uh, asynchronous programming in, in, in AS3 in particular is you just have this class which has an array of, of handlers for the different stages. And then you have event handlers and then you would jump here and that thing would start something else and that would jump there and there's no, except you knowing that the code is going to reach some step eventually, there's no way to tell that, you, that these things are in fact chained. And the way that you would, um, so this one for example looks, uh, okay this one is synchronous but if we were going to do asynchronous stuff, we could quite simply do, Whoop. Mm. We could quite simply do something like that. And and given this, well, okay, this of course does not work. Um, and it just so happens that Tinkerbell is written in a way that this works <laughs> already for free. Um, but this way you can, you can take two asynchronous uh, things and you can just chain them with one another. Let's look at what that might look like. So we had this, uh, this example in, in uh, our project not too long ago. You basically imagine you make a server call to start of a process and then you start pulling for the, for the current status, you know? And you just wanna know <coughs> what's going on. So the question is how would you, how would you do that, that pulling? Um, and so let's make a function that takes a type parameter, let's call it until. Um, and what it's actually going to do, it's going to, uh, let's call this body or re retry or attempt. Yeah, let's do, let's call this attempt. So this is a function that can always uh, generate a new promise of something. And then you have a, a condition. So that is something that takes the T and returns a bool. And so what we wanna do is we wanna be calling that function until that thing, you know, until our, until it's fine. Um, and maybe when, while we're at it, let's return the, the last, last result that we've actually had that satisfied our, our quest, um, so to say. So we can do, we can, we can attempt, and then next we're, we're actually going to uh, look at the result. Um, so this is the actual result. This is something of type T. Let's write it here so it's not any more complicated. And so what this, expects in return is again a promise of t at least that's what we're going to do and what we will do is we will return if the condition is uh is met by the result then we will return the result and otherwise we will uh we will, I'm sorry, we will until attempt condition, you know? And this is, ah, this is not valid in hex four anymore, I think. Oh, may not be, <laughs> we will see. Okay, let's see if this compiles at all. Okay, so it seems to compile. Um, there's a little party trick happening o over there. Uh, result is actually of type T, but promises uh, will autocast that to make it nice. Okay, and so now this is relatively cool. Like you can use this with uh, with everything. Does this thing have a time? I don't know. Does something else? Online time. Time. Time and date. Yeah. Oh, okay, this is not really possible. <laughs> um, I would have just pulled that thing, but uh, do you guys want to see that for fun or no? Yeah. Yes, okay. Hope, let's do it. Um, so where was I? This is it, okay. So we're basically, uh, so let's, let's just make our attempt function. So this is going to return a, a request of, is this, is this in here somewhere? Um, what should it say? It should maybe say September. Well, that's not really helpful. <laughs> okay, let's try. Uh, does anybody know a cool online time service? <laughs> <laughs> 66, you won't believe this. The internet is such an amazing place. Um, 
Okay, I suppose none of them work. Weather? No. Um, what else could we do? Okay, yeah, I have a... In the header? They have a date? You mean in the HTTP header? Okay, well, I suppose... We're going to we're going to have to rewrite this function then. Um, so this should give us headers. Uh, what is that? There's an array of named. Well, let's not make it too complicated. Um, so yeah, something like that. Um, okay, let's not be too picky. What does HTTP response headers do? Okay, let's use that one. Uh, string string so let's take these response headers and what we have to return now actually is going to be this is this is the body and the the headers will be something like this right let's see if that works let's see why it complains sorry I oh, know this is okay. This is it's header instead of headers. This one? Oh. Yeah, the field name. Ah, okay. Wow. Yeah, cool. We should program together more often. <laughs> Save a lot of time. Okay. So let's request. Uh, what was it? Google. I guess Google is picky about HTTPS. Oh no, I'm on Nico. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, fine. I mean, let's let's just go to Node then. <laughs> Node.js. Uh, we don't need this then. <coughs> and And we're going to run node out.js. Let's see if anything works now. Um, does it still compile? Ah, oh, node, we did not implement response headers. Okay. This is really cool. Any other time API? <laughs> okay, I feel we're, we're losing a bit too much uh, time right here. But yeah, I mean, let's assume, let's assume we could, we had a time API. Uh, Let's undo this, well, no. Get time dot com, get time now. Super awesome. Um, dot com. Um, so this would probably give us, give us some time, you know, the, the, the time. And then what we're gonna do next is, is so this is going to be uh, the response itself. Um, so let's take the response body. So that's a string. Um, try hex JSON pause. Um, yeah, we're going to return a success. Sorry. Um, b -b 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 let's assume that this will be. Let's assume that this will be something that has a time, which is a date. Although JSON does not ever pass dates, but who cares? Um, and let's catch an error, the pause error, and then, you know, you can just go, okay, let's return, return a failure in this case, um, new error, invalid JSON. <coughs> so this is our attempt, and then we can just say until, oh, well, let, let's be really, really cool. Let's attempt <coughs> okay does this build unexpected catch <laughs> yes this catch is unexpected sorry um does this compile ah uh, there was this node thing and there was uh, this bit whatever Okay, so this compiles. Um, so now we can say attempt until 
Um, and so now we need to give it a function um, that, you know, takes this, uh, let's call it time info. Return, I don't know, time info dot time get time is bigger than, I don't know, something, 12. <laughs> okay, so essentially, of course, this does, uh, this does nothing. Um, and what's, there's another property that, that's actually quite interesting is that, um, also taken from functional programming, is that Tinkerbell uh, promises are actually lazy. So none of this stuff is actually happening. Um, and until you register a handler, at least one handler, then it starts going. And what we actually have is this uh, asynchronous process, you know, that is unfolding and it will call the server again and again and again. And what's interesting is that when you unregister the last handler, then it also stops automatically, which is a property that you get through the laziness, basically. You could try to do it otherwise, but uh, yeah, you try, uh, you try some functional stuff and it turns out a lot of stuff comes for free. Um, even though it's all totally bad, um, how shall I say? side effect full code. So yeah, people would beat you for this probably, or I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> okay, um, was it clear until until here? Okay, and so what's, uh, what's actually quite interesting, I mean, we don't see that, that happening here is, um, is that uh, these, I mean, nothing in until is actually about the data. It's all about compositional units of, of flow and you can, you can you know, build up this arsenal of stuff and you can just stick it together and then you have these small functions that really just do one thing and at some point return something else. You can, you can throw them all together and we have uh, another different uh, property that's quite interesting is, is uh, because this is all promises, we know that there's an error involved somewhere and it travels out of band like we don't have to deal with the error in here, for example, the result. But when we handle it, we do. And uh, something else that we could we could also do is, let's just try that. Um, we could say attempt. Yeah, we could say just attempt this thing. So that's basic. It's it's uh, certain to fail. But we what we can do is we have this function that's called recover, and we're just going to say, okay, fair enough. Uh, we can recover by returning, um, like if the promise fails, we're just going to use this thing as a, as a default value. And lo and behold, when we handle this, then we actually know that the, that the object that we're getting is not an, not an outcome anymore, but is already the, the object that we wanted. And this is really quite nice because we can do async stuff and we can, um, we know whether there's going to be an error or not. If somebody upstream has already <coughs> handled it for us or not. Similarly, you can you can say, for example, um, you can have this. Well, kind of what we what we're doing here. Um, you can tell somebody else, okay, I'm going to consume an, uh, a function that does something asynchronous, um, but I want you to handle the errors. It's not my business. My business is, you know sorting order out or some, something like that, but you have to, you know, uh, make sure that you decide how you handle errors. So you can, you can establish really uh, strict um, responsibility boundaries between who actually handles errors in your application. Um, and this can be really important. I mean, at least in, in backend development, this is a thing that comes up a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we have all this stuff, that's cool. Um, there's all these kinds of other functions that I don't really want to bother you with. <laughs> um, but the, the interesting takeaway here is you have these promises, you can define operations on them, you have also signals, which I just shortly mentioned, that's something that can fire up a lot of time. Um, and when you miss it, then it's gone, whereas with the promise, you can, if you register too late, you still get the data, so that's also kind of interesting. Um, so these things, you know, mean completely different things. You can talk about them, 
it's not specific about the data. It's specific about the life cycle of the data or something. I would call it that way. And yeah, and you can build up stuff with that. Um, let's just, just to conclude this one rough idea. Yeah, let's just leave this here. Um, let's also uh, take, so this is, a, yeah, this is a signal also. Um, this is a, a writable signal, I would say. Okay, so you can you can trigger stuff on this and and whatnot, um, and this way you're going to get a uh, let's call this one trigger. Uh, and uh, this way we can we can change it into a signal, and so it's no longer possible for people from outside to dispatch events and stuff like that. And what's really quite interesting, like you have a couple of signal libraries in, uh, in, in Hacks, and most of them are kind of inspired by AS3 signals, I would say. And so there's uh, features like, for example, pausing and this kind of stuff that are implemented. Um, and it's kind of nice, but you're basically giving all the clients of the signal a single point to contend over. Like if you want to pause the signal, that's fine, but what if somebody else is subscribed? Um, so, how would we, how would we um, make post signals? Well, okay, so let's assume we have this, this signal of T, and then um, we have this is, well, actually, no, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> let's just have this float, okay? So this one is, is false. And then, um, what well we can, pausable is, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it's a signal, but what we're going to do is we're going to use these clever functional tricks, <laughs> function, and it's going to, usually you filter on the nature of the data, but why not depend on some external state, um, return not paused. And suddenly we've created a signal that is paused depending on this variable, and we can set that, but it will only, it will not affect the actual source. So we can create a possible signal for us. We can maintain the state for us, but it does not affect everybody else in the system. Is that more or less clear, what I'm saying? Or do we want to run that just to see? Okay, let's just, um, so, yeah. Signal handle um, x, sorry. So obviously this is, this is not gonna happen. <coughs> the signal ha handle x, so we say signal, or the, let's call this the raw signal, and possible handle x um, is, sorry, this should trace, obviously. <laughs> Are we, we're not going to see anything. Um, okay, and now we, we can take the trigger, like usually this is held by different parts of your system, like the trigger and the, and the view, uh, if you will, are not at the same place. But you know, let's trigger a zero and then maybe a one while we're at it. Why did I, uh, yeah. Okay, and now let's say uh, paused is uh, true. And let's, yeah, that's right. Okay, and let's run this and see what happens. So we basically see possible gets a one and a zero, and raw gets a, a sorry, zero and one, and raw gets a zero and a one, and then raw gets the two also. Like it's not affected. We can pause the, the possible signal that we've created, but we don't do it for everyone in the system. And we get that by pure composition. It's nothing that's built into signals. It's nowhere to be found. And you know, I, I mean, this could depend on, on, right now it's a variable that you control, but you know, this could be a, a check like a game engine is currently paused, you know? And this could be something in your UI. And if your game is currently paused, then basically the, and this could be, I don't know, launch nukes button, uh, something. So while the game is paused, you don't r respond to the to the launch nukes, you know. And you can do this really nicely, and you don't 
you don't really modify stuff wildly that could affect everyone. So that's that's really cool, and and it's not something that you have to do all the way. I mean, this is something that that composes really well. You can really nicely because. I'm not really sure, but I think most of us find uh, thinking in, in states and mutation of those and setting properties on objects and all that kind of stuff a really natural way of thinking. Um, it m might be that we're all just messed up, <laughs> but <laughs> we're not going to change it. So let's, you know, find ways to work with that. And uh, uh, yeah, kind of the trick is you can, you know, start reusing that and it's not a full or nothing game. Um, so, okay. That's this bit. Why does oh, okay? Let's let's make sure that it, uh, it keeps on compiling. Um, and so, I guess that's enough about the subject. Uh, composition, composition is important. Um, reducing mutability is is kind of important. Chaining things, you know, generic programming, all this kind of stuff. It's not really clear that it belongs to functional programming. And in some sense, th that you will find object-oriented patterns that are much like this. And it's just a uh, Try to watch out for these things, especially if you come from an AS3 background, you're probably not really used to writing this kind of stuff because uh, it was really hard, <laughs> mostly because of there was just this, this is your one friend, and it's not very helpful. Um, <laughs> but yeah, with, with Hex you have other possibilities, and yeah, try to, I think it's fun, and yes, it hurts sometimes, but <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, let's conclude that. And then there's, yes, please. Um, what happens in accepting a state, if you don't, if you don't have the integrity of your program fully, uh, you went back to the job of the request and you didn't have any exceptions? Sorry, where? If you, if you go try to catch and you're still using the same thing yeah. the state, if you didn't do that, then if an exception propagates... It would uh, kill everything. Probably. I mean, it depends on your on your runtime, but Tinkerbell does not handle exceptions. Well, there's actually like if you if you take the JSON parser that I uh, talked about earlier today, it produces outcomes rather than throwing exceptions. So that's I mean, it's a recurrent theme. You know, there's really only uh, I think three kinds of exceptions that must exist, kind of no matter what you do. One is uh, node pointer references. I hope we can actually, we, some languages can fix it, maybe we can too. Um, then there's stack overflows, which are kind of like <coughs> really a beast because even pure functions can run into those. And then there's, uh, then there's the wor worst ones is like allocation fails because you just, you know, but at that time it's really a good idea to close the program. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, um, but for everything else, I don't think you should be using exceptions because it's, like you will make your the client code that depends on you live in constant fear, and <laughs> I mean they will not call it that way, but they will approach programming this way, you know. Um, so yeah, be explicit, and when you know that something can throw, then yeah, try to catch it early on and propagate that information out. So yeah, um, so there's yeah there's all this. Okay, moving on now, or maybe somebody else. Have a question about that? No. Okay. Um, so there's yeah there's a there's a fun thing that I thought about recently and I, I want to talk about it with you. Um, do most of you know enums relatively well? Hex enums. Okay. And uh, do most of you know classes? Okay, great. Um, and which one w would you think is the is the more powerful feature in Hex? That's a trick question, yeah, of course. <laughs> who who thinks it's enums? Ah, okay. <laughs> who thinks it's classes? Okay, lots of people just don't have an opinion. <laughs> what a surprise. So, okay, um, let's go let's go on a on a trip then. Um, I'm going to uh, try something something weird. Um, let's recreate object orientation from scratch in Hacks. Um, anybody here a fan of Smalltalk? Okay, good. Um, yeah, I like Smalltalk, except that it's not Hacks. Uh. 
<laughs> so it's really cool. Um, so let's let's say, uh, like, how would you define uh, uh, a car in in uh, in object orientation? You would you would say something like this, okay? So there's there's this car, and it can say um, start engine or so, uh, function start engine, and I don't know, and maybe stop engine. And then there's uh, get speed or s or something like that, okay? Like all these all these kinds of things, um, and and um, basically in, in languages that kind of work like like C plus plus, this is this is really uh, yeah, this should be a float, obviously, or something. Um, the way that this works in in most languages that kind of inherit from C plus plus is that you have this uh, thing which is just a bag of functions that somehow get looked up through a vtable and, and that's kind of it. And Smalltalk had this weird idea of, of messages, you know, uh, which is kind of interesting because it makes a function invocation uh, a first class thing. And so, so the way that you could, for example, uh, say the same thing is you say a uh, car message is um, either there's a way to, you know, start an engine um, or stop an engine or get the speed and there's going to be a callback here and let's let's put other callbacks here that are just you know f for the sake of uniformity we're going to use something like this okay um, and so this is basically just the message that you can send to a car and it, then when when it's done executing the message it will just call you back for example um, so what is a what is a what is a car then? In this parlance, we are basically kind of done here. Okay, it's just a function that accepts car messages and then just does stuff with them. Okay, um, now I think I had this. Yeah, I do have this here, somewhere. Okay, this is cool. Uh, so I actually prepared a bit of code so we don't have to spell everything out. But if I'm going too fast, let me know. Um, this one, yeah. Okay, so for example, we could, uh, we could, we could, where is this? Is it here? Ah, okay. I should learn naming files. Um, so okay, here I here I took something something different, and actually, this is more more kind of uh, interesting. Uh, do some of you guys know GADTs? Okay, not really. Um, so the interesting part in, in enums is that uh, you can say that every constructor of an enum has a different creates a different type. Like normally, you can think of these things in enums, we call them constructors because what you could say, it's, it's a function that takes a couple of arguments and it returns you a value that is of the type that the enum is. These are, well, sorry, these are called algebraic data types and there's a generalization of that which says that the return type must, need not always be the same, okay? Can be different. So for example, the message to, uh, get the speed is a car message of float, and the message to set the speed is a car message of void. What we can do this way is to avoid the, the where did I do this? This kind of callback thingy in here, you know? Um, otherwise, they're technically kind of equivalent, but it's kind of nicer to do that way, arguably. So, um, so in here we, Let's close this so that I don't reopen it again. Um, and in this module, let's look at what a what a car is here. So basically, we're actually using an object here. The only reason for that is that in hex you can't have uh, free type parameters floating around on functions; they must be on fields or something like that. But a car is something that can takes uh, that can take a car message of type t and will return a t. So meaning. If we go in, in here, um, I think I created, yeah, I created a car somewhere. Okay, so this is, this is done way too complex, okay. 
Um, but what we could, yeah, what you would basically say, let's, let's implement, implement a, a simpler car for now. Um, var car is a car. Oh, now I remember why I did this that way. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to show that then. Um, let's look at the function that I've that I've actually created. Uh, so we have this. Uh, yeah, we have this car, and so this is a function that creates cars for us. It creates this internal state object that we're not letting to go somewhere. Like okay, in this case, it's a it's an object, but it. You would use a record or something like that if you if you wanted to. Or this could just be a, a variable, and you uh, and we sh we give this uh, we have this function which is called a a car operation, and what this does is it takes a car state and a car message and it then performs what actually a car would do. Like if you get the speed, it will it will return the speed. And if you set the speed, then it will update the speed and will return void. Um, you have to write this here. <laughs> and and then we create a new function that kind of always only operates on that state. This is uh, only a little party trick because you can't put type parameters in local functions or stuff like that. It's built a weird way. But the way that you would do it in the most forward matter would be var car is func uh, send and so this should be a function of t car message t and then you know you will you will probably have your speed here and then you will do the the stuff that i showed there but hex will freak out about this bit because you can't have that on a uh, our value functions or something like that. So we're doing this uh, kind of yeah, a weird way around. We have this we have this function that can operate on a state and we we shove it into an object. All of these things are not actually needed if we could have type parameters on on function types themselves. Um, but yeah, okay. So we have this car and it's uh, and it's really like we can we can just uh, say things like car send uh, said speed 12 and then trace car send get speed so this is going to return as a float and we can trace that and let's let's finish at this point why is this happening okay this is stuff that i want to be showing later um and this is also stuff that i want to be showing later <laughs> cool so wow we created an object um okay so at this point it's it's kind of uh, boring but what is actually really quite interesting is um because messages become first first uh first order things you pass them around you can look at them you can for example if you want to have something like a like a spy that that knows everything that is being invoked like we could we could make a a spy car and that's really just a function that traces every message that comes through and then delegates it to an actual car or you know you can take uh, two broken cars and you know that one has a working engine and the other one has working wheels and depending on <laughs> what message you need to process you can you can you know delegate it really cheaply and you can do that uh, pretty well for a couple of reasons, one of them is that pattern matching is so so expressive on, on enums. Like you can just say these cases send them there, the other cases send them there, and if you wanted to achieve that kind of forwarding in uh, in object oriented programming, it either takes a lot of macros, so there's ways to do that, <laughs> or you have to write a whole lot of code yourself. Like for example, if you want to implement i event dispatcher. Uh, then you have to forward all of these calls down to the event dispatcher and it would be much easier this way you know <clears throat> so so yeah that's kind of cool you have all this forwarding uh, type of stuff and all that thing um, I also did the same for points so what is a point point is four messages you know I mean there's nothing really interesting about that and then I started hacking around um, so let's let's do this don't really do this at home but um, 
at some point, <laughs> it would actually be really nice to be able to say uh, to say this. I think there's also a, a, pro a proposal for that. Um, and say, okay, so a car or point message is is this, you know, something of that sort. And for enums, it would actually be really kind of nice to be putting them together. Uh, we can do it like so, <laughs> um, with with a bit of thinking. And then we add this uh, little discern helper on top, which will tell us is this a car message, is this uh, something something message. And then a car and a point is something that can receive a car and point message. So what we've just done is is actually multiple inheritance. Uh, you know, we inherit from car and point, which is kind of pointless. But uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's these there's these classical of examples of where it goes wrong. And I mean, if we if we were to add uh, get x here and make that something that I don't know takes Chuck Norris. Uh, or I don't know, Chuck is a Chuck Norris, um, and and would be uh, ah no, wrong in the in the car. Get would I don't know. So this would be a car message of roundhouse kick. Um, let's just make these or something. Uh, Okay, there's actually no collision, quite interestingly, because the, the constructor always belongs to some enum. So um, what happens here? Okay, this should, this should yeah. Case, uh, what did I say? Chuck Norris? No, what did I call this thing? Oh yeah, get x. Um, throw, oh yeah, this is, this is Chuck. Throw roundhouse kick by Chuck or something like that. You know, we're never Chuck. Okay, and so now it magically compiles. And the thing is, like, so here we say, um, like, here we actually compose a car in a point to a current point. And we can do things like uh, car point set speed 42. And we can also send uh, get x. And we see that in this context, the compiler would resolve it to, um, to the point message because of precedence. But we could also just say car message get x. And then it would want a, a chuck, you know. OK. And so. Um, you actually kind of bypass the problem because you have actual messages. They have actual types attached to them. It's not just a bag of data. Um, and you get to uh, combine these things together really well. Um, so yeah, uh, in and on itself, it's, it's a silly thing to do because obviously we have classes and we have great ways to live without multiple inheritance and all this kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> but there's a, a, there's a pattern. How am I for time anyway? Um, Ah, okay, almost done. Um, there's a pattern in, in, uh, in, um, that you find often in, in bigger software, and it's something like uh, event buses or stuff like that. You know, you have this kind of. And um, it turns out that enums are actually a really good way to deal with that kind of stuff. Um, so you can, you know, you could dispatch an enum, which is a GADT, and then you can expect something in return, all this kind of stuff. And um, um, but no, let's show the thing that I prepared first because then we're actually uh, uh, kind of out of time. Um, so I did this, did this uh, kind of compositional function once again. Yoo -hoo. Um, this is something that, that takes a number of workers, which are just functions that take an input and return an output, and uh, it round robins work between them. You know, so. You know, it returns one function, and the the argument is always forwarded into one, and then into the next, and then it comes back again. So this is relatively cool. Um, I mean, or maybe useless. It doesn't. It does stuff. Um, and so now, what we're what we're actually going to do 
Ah, there's also something else uh, in background. Okay. Um, and I think I will need this bit. Okay, does this still compile? Yeah, okay. <coughs> so this is a small uh, library that, uh, that actually creates a run loop for, for static targets, uh, sorry, for usually blocking targets. And it allows you to create slaves, which are kind of background workers that work on separate threads. And what you can do is you can let the current run loop delegate some function onto a, a worker, onto a slave, and then it returns a future that resolves back on the, on the main thread. So this turns a synchronous function asynchronous. Okay, so let's, let's uh, oh, and there's something else we're going to do. We're going to uh, define a car proxy. Proxy is probably not the, not the best way here, but it, it almost looks like a car, except that it's going to return a promise for us. That's the only difference. So this is how, and this is how you would do proxies. Like if you need to communicate with an object that's far away and the stuff is asynchronous, uh, voila, if you do it with message passing, then you can get this really for free. Or you know, if somebody else handles the error, then this becomes the type or you know, um, what I was talking about before. So let's, let's create a, let's create what I'd call a, a multi-car, which uh, is another pointless invention. And we're, what we're actually doing is um, we're taking a whole bunch of cars and we are executing the, the send method in background on some, on some other thing. And so there's 10 of these and we're going to round robin around that. And so what we can do, for example, is yeah, send all of this stuff out and then also uh, get back what this is. I'm going to run this, let's see if it does. Okay, so this works pretty cool. And just to show that it actually runs on separate threads, let's make it sleep for what the current speed is. I mean, the speeds are numbers from zero to nine or 10, 10, yeah. And so what we see is, I hope, yeah, that we're actually getting the results one by one because the different threads just complete each behind a second. And this, um, it's like a really nice way to shove stuff into, well, in this case, it's a, it's a background thread, but it could be a server that is running somewhere else, a different process, all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, generally, like if you're, if you're passing data out, then maybe it's, a, it's a, and you wanted to have an interface, then it's maybe a useful idea to think of it just as an enum of messages, and you can pass them around and do this kind of stuff. And I think uh, those of you who want to get into macros, uh, there's, there's a fun little problem, which I hadn't yet, yet time before, is, um, I will surely write it down. Uh, let's call it message fire build. Um, so this could be something that, that where message is an, is an enum value. Can I write this, I guess? I think. And what it would actually do is uh, you you make a you say type def car is a receiver receiver of car messages or something like that, and this is actually going to make an an interface. So this is actually going to generate the the actual interface, the stuff like that you know, all the messages, and you can do the converse. So you don't actually have to pick. Like you can, you can start from interface, say, uh, make me the enum for this, or you can do the converse and it can apply all this kind of stuff. So yeah, that's a, that's a fun little thing to think about. And um, what was I on before? Okay, let's do this really, really, <laughs> really, really quick. Um, so yeah, let's assume Let's assume, like what, what could an event bus possibly look like? Um, let's do it this way. Interface event bus. Function uh, register. So this could be a handler that, uh, yeah, T, and this should be an enum value. Ah, uh, it does not, uh, let me think. 
well, it's not really important at this point. But let's say let's say something like this, and and you could. But the m more important thing is what you what you can actually do is you can you can write it so that um, that when you trigger this message, you get a. Let me check. Yeah. So you wanna you wanna be triggering the value, and what you get back is a promise of I don't know. In this case, it's kind of hard to make it two-way, but you could make it a, a two-way thing. Huh? Okay, this way. And you can you can make your event bus so that that it returns a promise because the way to interact with it normally is uh, you just trigger some event and you listen for a, for another, and you hope that someday somebody is hopefully going to call you back. And a different way to build this thing is. Uh, actually in here look if there's some handler or something or like why not wait five seconds even if somebody registers later because you know big applications do weird stuff um, and then return a promise for example if something is not there like nobody has registered all this kind of stuff so you can like instead of hoping and waiting for things to complete eventually you can really let the let the type system do this kind of stuff for you okay um, but I think I'm done with my time so yeah, um, any questions, maybe? Yes. I hate clean code. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so yeah, I mean, basically all the things that we've touched on here is Tinkor, and actually if you, if you move up the abstraction stack in the Tinkerbell libraries, you're going to find that stuff everywhere, like the I.O. stuff that I touched on today, it, it all follows the same philosophy. It all, uh, it's built with these um, combination functions and you have errors propagated properly and all this kind of stuff. And then at some point you're, you're going to plug a framework on top like ThinkWeb and it's going to also handle errors as it, as it should, you know. And there's, one can be reasonably sure that, that things actually work. I mean, except the occasional exception, but <laughs> I mean, runtime exception. <laughs> of all the stuff you have in your various libraries, is there anything where you say we should move it to the next standard so everyone stops making their own versions of it? Ah, I don't like to impose so much. Um, <laughs> but yeah, prob pro probably, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that should be looked into. I think most of the stuff that that is in Tinkerbell Core is really, I mean, the, the library has got to be like seven years old now. So I think it's not going to change that much anymore. And we could move it in there. And um, yeah, the only thing I'm always worried about when moving code into the standard library is, is how quickly can it be updated. But for the things that don't change much, yeah, we, we should look into that. <laughs> Anyone? No? Okay. So then, thank you very much. Uh.